So in this video, we're going to take a quick look at 3D determinants and try to develop a little bit of an intuition for what is going on there. Now I've written out the formula for the determinant of a 3 by 3 matrix on the board here. The determinant of A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I is this formula right here. And we're going to try to parse what is going on. We want to do this in the context of what we already learned about 2D determinants. Remember, for a 2D determinant, we're looking at two axes and how much the area of this space is getting scaled up, how much the area of that parallelogram is getting bigger. In the context of three dimensions for a 3x3 three three matrix, rather than how much the area is getting scaled, we're looking at how much the volume is getting scaled. So in order to do that, we're going to have to use our handy 3D diagrams. Let's start out just with our basics. We have an x, y, and z axis. And we want to think about how much volume of a particular cube here is getting scaled up. First of all, what does this part here mean? A times the determinant of E, F, H, I. Well, remember from the last video when we're looking at matrices that the columns represent inputs and the rows represent outputs. So if we think about our 3 by 3 matrix, but just looking at the components that we're using in this term, we have E, F, H, and I right here. And then we have our A over here in the top left. So notice everything in the same row and column as the A has sort of been canceled out. But what's happening here is the Y and Z inputs to the Y and Z outputs are in this matrix. So this determinant is talking about how much does the YZ plane get scaled up when we do this matrix. And the A is the X input to the X output, meaning how much does the X axis get scaled parallel to itself. So this A times this determinant here is saying we multiply how much the X component here gets scaled times how much the YZ plane gets scaled. And because those processes are perpendicular to each other, this is the exact same thing as taking the volume of a rectangular prism. We're doing the base, which in this case is our YZ planes area, times the height, which is our perpendicular X axis's area. But now we have these extra two parts. Now in order to understand this second component here, B times the determinant of this matrix, we have to start thinking about that book closing idea from the 2D determinant video. Let's take a look at what B means first. B is how much a Y input gets mapped to an X output. In other words, if we think about the initial vector going along the Y axis, if B is a positive number, that Y axis is going to start getting turned towards our X. So it's going to look something like this. Notice our Y axis is rotating this way towards the X. And what is this determinant that we have here? It's another area scaling situation. But in this case, we're looking at XZ inputs getting mapped to YZ outputs. That's a little bit weird, but let's think about this in terms of planes. We're looking at the XZ plane, which is this plane coming in this direction right here. And we're thinking about moving it towards the YZ plane. So I'm going to draw a second plane here. And it's going to look like this. So in this case, we can think about this almost like a door swinging shut, where we have our YZ plane here, this part, and our XZ plane over here. It started out perpendicular. The XZ plane has started moving towards that YZ plane. At the same time as that door is closing, our y-axis is moving towards the direction of x. So we see these two forces are coming together. And that means that our original volume, which is a cube, is getting skinnier and skinnier, just like in the 2D case. That's why we're subtracting this phenomenon. We're saying when these two parts start getting closer and closer together, that's going to make our final volume smaller. So we have to subtract this area scaling effect to account for that. Now this third term here is going to have a similar effect to the second term. So let's take a look at what that means in the matrix. 
we have a z input going to an x output, and then we have this determinant, which is x, y being mapped to y, z. Now that is a little weird. We would normally expect, like before, we had x, z going to y, z. So z stayed as the second part. In this case, we have x, y to y, z. But wouldn't it make more sense to have x, y going to z, y? That way y stays as the second part. It would, and in fact, the reason that we have a plus here instead of a minus is that we should really be having a zy over here, but we have a yz. And the fact that those are flipped is what makes us add the area instead of subtracting it. It turns out that when you take a 2D determinant and flip the two rows, that makes it negative. So we do negative times a negative makes a positive. In this case, we have to take another geometric approach. When we look at z being mapped to x, that means that we're taking our z vector and it's starting to turn like this down towards the x. And then when we look at x, y going to z, y. Well, x, y is essentially the floor of our plane here. It's down here. And it's going to start moving up towards z, y. So if we take a look at the x, y plane along the ground, Let's think about what would happen if it started to move upward like this. It would maybe look something like that. So what this diagram is saying is that we've started with a flat plane along the floor with our z-axis like this, and our bottom component has started to move up towards that z-axis. So we started on the floor, and it's bending up this way kind of like a ramp. In this case, again, notice the z component is starting up and coming down. This floor component is starting down and going up. So what do we get? We get the book closing effect. That, again, is going to make the volume smaller. And so we have to take that into account when we do the 3D determinant. So that's where the formula for a 3D determinant comes from. Just like with the 2D determinant, we start out by looking at how the axes scale perpendicular to each other. But we also have to account for the book closing effect, this time with two different terms since we're in three dimensions. Once we do that, we subtract those effects off, and that gives us our final solution that looks just like this.